The garden's looking amazing, but it's easy to feel overwhelmed with all the growth and harvests. But don't worry, there are some key jobs which if we get them done now, will make gardening life a breeze. In cooler summers or earlier on in the summer when there are fewer pollinating insects around, it sometimes pays to hand pollinate your squash family plants. That's the likes of winter squash and these here are zucchini or courgettes for example. Now not only will this mean you get your fruits earlier and you'll get more of them, it'll also avoid problems from poor pollination like the ends of the fruits growing a bit squishy like this here. Now it's really simple to do, let me show you. Now our first job is to look for a male flower and these are quite straightforward to identify because they don't have a bulge behind the flower, they've just got a straight stem. This is actually quite a bizarre one because I've got two male flowers fused into one stem here, but you can see the stem is nice and clear and straight. And now the next job is just to peel back the flowers to reveal the stamen in the middle. And with the petals plucked back, you can see we've got the stamens in the middle here and these tiny bits of pollen, that's the bright yellow stuff. Now we've got to look for a female flower. Now the female flowers are really easy to identify because they're the ones with the immature fruit behind the back of the flower, the sort of bulge. And these are really easy because they're yellow zucchini or courgettes. Now, it's, again, it's a question of revealing the middle of the flower, the female parts, and then just getting our pollen here on the end of the stamen and just brushing right in the middle of the flower like that to pollinate it. And that's as easy as that. Now each flower should do, I would say, at least kind of three flowers maybe, three females. Incidentally, something I have learnt is that it's worth growing at least two, preferably three or more uh, plants of the same variety in close proximity. This way it ups the chances of there being both male and female flowers open at the same time, so there's more chance of them crossing. And cross-pollination generally leads to better fruit set as well. Regular viewers will know how much I absolutely love garlic and I've been growing it for years. Now once over half the leaves are yellow, it's unlikely to be growing anymore and it's good to harvest. These guys here are quite badly infected with rust. It's not the end of the world and they've grown really well so it is time to harvest them though. And to do that, it's very straightforward. Just get a fork in underneath the bulb, making sure you don't accidentally spear it and just lever back and forth until your bulb comes free. And there we go. See, that doesn't look too bad, does it? Now, don't delay harvesting them because once they are ready to harvest, they'll start to deteriorate if they are left in the ground. It goes without saying that we need to handle the bulbs with care so we don't accidentally bruise them. And then when you've got the soil on them like this, just loosely shake it like that. No more than that. We don't want to sort of be excessively clean with them because we'll do that once they've dried out. Now these guys, if we want to store them for any period of time, which I thoroughly recommend, we can just lay them out in a single layer in a rack somewhere sort of dry and warm. Um, I use my greenhouse, but a sunny kind of windowsill might do. Or you could hang them up somewhere dry as well in bunches. Now they take about two to four weeks to dry out completely and you'll know they're dry because the foliage will be nice and dry and crispy, at which point you can just gather them up and move them to somewhere cool and dry where they should store for several months, as much as next spring. There are some smells of the summer garden I really love. Roses, sweet peas, but for me, the winner is garlic. Mm, divine. Summer is a fantastic time to expand your herb collection and one of the very easiest ways to do that is to use supermarket packets of herbs like these as long as they're fresh. Keep them cool till they're all ready to go, then let's burst them open and take our cuttings. What we're looking for is a cutting that's about four to six inches or 10 to 15 centimetres long and then we make our first cut just below a leaf node, that's just where the leaves join the stem and then we're gonna remove the lowest leaves like this to leave just the ones on top. And the idea is that it's not too stressed out by having too many leaves to kind of service. Just take that one off as well. So something like that is absolutely perfect. Now with uh, 
fleshy leaved herbs like mint here and basil, which I'm gonna do next, they root really easily, just popping them into water like this. Keep this in a bright place, top up the water continuously as it goes down and actually change it as well so it doesn't get too algae. And then after maybe, I don't know, anything from two to three weeks, once they've got a good little root system to them, you can then pot them up into all-purpose potting mix to grow on until you're ready to plant them out. These are the basil. Again, just remove most of the leaves, cut just below a node and pop it in the water. I'm gonna to have to top that water up, I think. And this is a great way to keep herbs going indefinitely like this. You can just keep on taking cuttings from established plants and keep them going. Woodier herbs like say rosemary and thyme are best planted straight into potting mix, to which I add a little bit of grit or perlite just to improve drainage. Now keep everything nice and moist, and once they've rooted, you can just carefully split them apart and pot them on. At the same time as bagging ourselves some new herbs, we can be enjoying the herbs that are cropping right now. That includes putting some aside for the winter. Now I'm not too worried about evergreen herbs like these here, which will be sitting around even through the colder months, but I do want to make sure I'm capturing some of the bounty of leafy herbs that I know will die back as soon as it gets cold. Herbs like mint, for example. Now here is my mint patch, and it's got some nettles running through it as well. It's a bit unruly, but coincidentally, Mint and nettles make a fantastically refreshing tea combined, so it's not all bad, is it? Now, this is apple mint, and this stuff is gold dust in teas. So refreshing. So I'm gonna cut myself some now, and we're gonna dry this out to make sure we've got plenty for the winter months. That smells really great. That takes me back to, like, drinking mint teas in Morocco, actually. That really distinctive smell, it's just, mmm. With our stems cut, just shake off any kind of potential spiders or little bits of twig or something. And then we're just gonna pick off the leaves and lay them onto these trays here to pop them into the dehydrator. Now, not everyone has a dehydrator, of course, so this would also work by popping them onto a baking sheet in an oven set to the lowest possible temperature, perhaps even with the door left ever so slightly ajar and check regularly to make sure you're getting a nice even dry. But a dehydrator makes this job a doddle. Lay your leaves out and then once they're fully dried, maybe three or four hours with this, they can be flaked out into jars and kept in a cool, dark, dry place to enjoy through the colder months. We'll go inside to plug this in, obviously. The slugs have been absolutely relentless this year. They've really massacred my beans and my uh, cauliflowers over there, forcing me to make repeat sowings and plantings. Well, here are my tips to getting on top of slugs. Keep grass short around your growing areas so they have fewer places to hide. Set half grapefruit traps like this. Coconut uh, halves work well as well. Now they love to hide under here in the day and you can just pick them off and remove any you find and reset your trap. Remove weeds and dead leaves to keep the ground clear of debris and head out after dark to pick them off by flashlight or torch as they come out to feed. With slugs, it really is a matter of returning again and again to gradually deplete the population. I absolutely love rhubarb. Not only is it a great ingredient for all sorts of crumbles, fools and puddings, it also looks jolly handsome. And the leaves here can be used exactly like we did for our grapefruits, just hanging around on the ground for slugs to hide underneath and then you can pick those off and that goes on the compost heap once you're done. And of course, you can eat the stems. Now, as we come into the second half of summer, we really need to finish picking our rhubarb now and leaving it alone so that the leaves can recharge the crown and get all that goodness into the roots so it's got lots of muscle ready for next season. Let's take our last harvest. There's a point in summer when you know you're home and dry with your corn and it's sooner than you might think. Now there's a saying, knee high by the 4th of July, and that neatly sums it up. If your corn is that high by then, well, by the end of that month, you'll have head high corn that's gonna 
have plenty of time to set those beautiful cobs. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, well, maybe it's knee high by the 4th of January, but you get the idea. Now these here are my corn. They're still a bit shorter than that, but we're filming a week before the start of July. So I know these guys are gonna be there by then. And by the end of the month, they'll be head height, producing those tassels ready to set those beautiful cobs. Corn is wind pollinated, which is why we plant it in a block like this to maximize the chances of the pollen drifting down from the tassels at the top of the plant to the silks at the end of the young cobs halfway down. And this is what a cob looks like if it doesn't get enough pollen to properly pollinate the whole thing. Because of this, and if there isn't enough wind, I like to just tap the stems of the corn to release clouds of pollen that really maximize that pollination effect. That way I'll get cobs with many more kernels nicely filled. This simple act will greatly improve things, especially if your garden is sheltered like mine. Hopefully you'll have plenty of follow on or succession crops waiting in the wings to replace earlier crops. And when you get them planted, it's really important to keep them well watered. Now, if you're never sure about quite how far to space your plants, then do check out the garden planner because if you click the information button on a crop, you can just immediately see the recommended spacings for that crop just to get it right. If it's really dry, then one thing you can do just to make sure there's plenty of moisture in there is make your planting hole, fill it with water, let that drain and then plant. That way you've got water exactly where it's needed right at the roots. That can be really helpful for really thirsty plants like these celery here. Keep an eye on recent transplants and water them before the soil fully dries out so they can establish quickly and unchecked. With the halfway point of the growing season upon us, there's no time like now to top up soil fertility. Now a good dollop of nutrient rich organic matter added earlier in the winter, for example, garden compost, should power along most crops for much of the growing season. But if you do notice that plants are struggling, they haven't quite reached their stride or they just seem to be ugh, a bit like that, well, it's time to break out the organic fertilizer. Chicken manure pellets are a fantastically concentrated form of organic matter, far more concentrated than fresh manure. Now this is great just sprinkled in around actively growing plants and tickled in at around four to five ounces per square yard or 150 grams per square meter. A great alternative is blood, fish and bone, and it's used in much the same way, just at half the concentration. This stuff is really great for root growth, which gives therefore stronger crops and better yields. Now, as a general rule, a small handful like this is just over an ounce or 35 grams. So use that as a kind of a measure. Now, if you're not keen on animal derived uh, fertilizers, well, no problem at all. Look out for organic, vegan, plant-based alternatives, which will work just as well. In our last sowing video, I started off among other things, some pak choy or bok choy. Here they are now, a few pecked out by the pigeons, but growing along nicely. Now I love pak choy stir fried, absolutely yummy. But another Asian green I really rate is Chinese cabbage, the perfect ingredient for making a kimchi, thoroughly recommended by the way. Now, most Asian greens like a kind of shady, cool spot. So if you're sowing and growing at this time of year, then dappled shade is the way to go. And like my pak choy there, I'm just gonna sow them into plug trays, two seeds per plug, and then cover them over. Now I could sow them direct, of course, but starting off in plug trays like this means I can get them going while the ground's still occupied over there. So I'm overlapping my crops effectively. And then with them sown, let's just cover them over. Now these guys, once they're grown on and filled the plugs, will be planted about a foot or 30 centimeters apart in both directions. And as I say, they need to be kept out of the really hot sun and kept really well watered because they are cool season crops. I'll give these a good drink in a moment. Now, Chinese cabbages can look really shocking as they approach harvests, really ugly beasts, but peel back the manky old leaves and you'll reveal that crisp white heart at the middle of it. 
Did you know there's still plenty to be sewing this month? If you've not seen it, do check out my sewing video next, which you'll find here. I will catch you next time.